Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me for this talk. As Jessica said, what we're going to talk about to here today is the biology of being a father. And my title is probably a little bit clickbait, what's the point of dads? But it reflects an ongoing question in our society. Because when we think about fathers, if we were just to look at our media and the conversations maybe some of us have, we would think that dads were around for, well, obviously, as sperm donors. We haven't got to that point yet where we can have a baby without the involvement of a male human. However, if you read some of the think pieces over the last couple of years, some people think that's on the way. If we look at the headlines in some of our newspapers, dads are absent, and they are the cause of many of society's ills. If you look at the adverts on our television, it, recently there was one for one of those voice-activated robots which really made the dad look completely useless unless he had a point-by-point -point, uh, reminder from his wife of what to do every day. Or they are the babysitter. So fathers don't parent, they babysit. And I'm pretty sure that's something that we've all said as mothers when we go out on a, on a Saturday night that our partner is babysitting. And if you were to listen to all this propaganda, these stereotypes of what a father is, you would come to the conclusion that fathers are dispensable. We actually don't need them. Now, personally, I find this quite hard to take. If I look at the fathers in my life, the people I know, my friends, fathers when I was growing up, these are not the fathers that I knew. And secondly, personally, as, uh, professionally, as an evolutionary anthropologist, I find this very hard to take. Because you see, Human fathers are rare. Only 5% of mammals have, have investing fathers, and we are the only ape who has investment in our offspring. Now, the reason for this is those two whammies of being a human, having an enormous brain and being bipedal, walking on two legs. And because of this, our babies are born undercooked, just to make sure they can safely get through the birth canal without risking mum or child. But because of this, they are incredibly helpless, and we are not capable of raising them alone. Now, this all started happening about 1.8 million years ago, and first of all, it was women who turned to other women to help them raise these dependent offspring. And this all went very well for about the first a million years. But about 500,000 years ago, something else happened. Our brains got even bigger. And at that point, girl power was not enough. Females could no longer rely on each other, help each other out, and raise their babies. And our ancestral species were actually at risk of extinction because we could not replace the population. So somebody needed to step in. And the best person for that, from an evolutionary point of view, is someone who is genetically closely invested in the survival of that offspring. And that is dad. So human fatherhood evolved half a million years ago. And in fact, the first sentence of my book is, it's a little known fact, but fathers saved the human race. And it's very much the truth that if human fatherhood had not evolved, our ancestors would have died out. So the fact that, that human fathers are a rarity in the mammalian kingdom leads me to two conclusions. The first is that evolution does not leave things to chance. It's not going to create something as unusual as a human father without giving him a pretty good chance of being able to fulfill that role. And this means that I think, and this is what I thought over a decade ago, fathers must have been primed biologically to be able to parent. We're not going to leave this really vital uh, role to chance. And over the last 10 years, I and my colleagues have discovered this is exactly the truth. So first of all, when a man becomes a father for the first time, his testosterone drops. And as long as he remains in contact with that child, not necessarily cohabiting, but in contact with him or her, it will never return to pre-birth levels. Now, we know this to be a universal case. So it doesn't matter where the man lives, from Senegal to the Philippines, from China to Canada, from London to Jamaica, this happens to new fathers. And we shouldn't really be surprised, because in all species where they're investing fathers, whether you're a bird, a reptile, or a mammal, this drop in testosterone occurs. And it's absolutely crucial that it does. Because you see, testosterone is a great hormone. It makes a man a man. And when he's on the mating dating scene, it's really important that he can have high levels as possible because it makes him more competitive against his fellow males to find that partner, and it makes him more attractive to the opposite sex. However, when you become a dad for the first time, we really need you to focus in on your family. We don't need your eye wandering every time uh, a lady walks past in the street. And therefore, that testosterone has got to go. 
And we know that men with lower testosterone are more sensitive fathers. So they are more motivated to care for their offspring. They get more joy and more pleasure from doing so. Their emotions are positive about it. We're still not entirely sure what mechanism causes this testosterone to drop. It's not the case that men with lower testosterone are more likely to become fathers. In fact, the opposite is true. So it's not to do with them already being pretty low down on the testosterone levels. We think it's probably something to do with maybe cohabiting during pregnancy, and it's certainly something to do with interacting with your babies. But it's not a pheromone. It's nothing to do with pheromones. It's not down to olfaction as occurs in the lower mammals, because the areas of our brain linked to olfaction are so minutely small. As well as making you a more sensitive father, having a drop in testosterone also makes you more likely to bond with your child and to find that relationship you build more enjoyable. Because testosterone inhibits the impact of dopamine and oxytocin in your brain. Now, those are two key chemicals when we're building relationships with each other. So oxytocin is known as the love hormone, and dopamine is what gives you the reward for doing anything you enjoy. So, by dropping that testosterone, a man gets a bigger hit of oxytocin and dopamine when he interacts with his child, meaning that he will build a firm and enjoyable bond. Looking at some of the other neurochemicals that are whizzing around when you become a father, a key one is oxytocin, and we know that men who cohabit with their pregnant partner experience something known as biobehavioral synchrony in their oxytocin levels. Now, biobehavioral synchrony was a phenomenon discovered by Ruth Feldman, who's an Israeli neuroscientist, and it occurs in closely bonded relationships. So it's quite rare, but you might have it with your partner, with your children, sometimes possibly with your best friend. And it describes the phenomenon that when you are interacting with them, first of all, your behavior comes into synchrony. Now, I think we all recognize this when we maybe look at our friends who are in love. You know, they, they imitate each other's gestures, they sound the same. That's that behavioral synchrony. But if we look inside the body, we see physiological synchrony. So heart rates, body temperature, and blood pressure come into synchrony. And if we look in the brain, then brain activation and neurochemistry comes into synchrony. So when you, it, when you cohabit with your pregnant partner, your oxytocin levels come into synchrony. And this is something to do with making sure you are incredibly tightly bonded together, that you are team parents, so that when you have this wonderful baby who is really going to push you to the limits, you are as strongly bonded as a team as possible. But beyond the hormones, we also see changes in the brain. And these actually mirror the changes that women experience when they become parents for the first time. So this was a study carried out that looked at men's brains four weeks after their first baby was born and then four months after their baby was born. And what they saw was changes in the grey and white matter of the brain which reflect what happens in mothers. And these changes in grey and white matter occurred in areas of the brain which are key to being a good parent. So if we look at the very core of the brain, in the limbic area of the brain where your unconscious mind sits, areas linked to nurturing, and risk detection, that vital risk detection in the amygdala, had increased in size. And if we looked at the neocortex, then areas linked to problem solving, planning, and uh, goal orientation had increased in size. They were in the, the lateral prefrontal cortex and the orbitofrontal cortex, the very front of your brain, which is involved in all those important tasks for parenting. So goal orientation, for example, is important because you need to focus on your child and ignore all the other distractions around it. So we see exactly the same biological priming in men to be parents as we do in women. Also, we looked at the, the inheritance of parenting behavior. Now, this is quite a tricky thing to do, but by using twin studies and by trying to isolate those genes that are linked to sensitive parents, we get an idea of how much of fathering is environmentally inherited and how much of it is genetically inherited. So two key genes linked to oxytocin seem to impact how sensitive you are as a father. These are the oxytocin receptor gene and CD38, which controls the levels of oxytocin in your blood. Now, we all exist at different baseline levels of oxytocin, and that impacts on our sensitivity as a parent and our experiences in any other close relationship. But there are two versions of these genes which actually incre increase the risk that a man will struggle being a sensitive parent. It doesn't mean it's deterministic and that he will not be able to sensitively parent, but he will find it harder. He will find it harder to clue into what his child needs, have those levels of empathy that are important, deal in a non-intrusive but reciprocal way with his child. So about 20% of fathering is genetically inherited. 
but about 80% is from your environment. And that might be the fathering figure you had or did not have as a child, looking at other men in your environment, and also other psychological impacts upon you. So that's my first conclusion. And evolution has not left things to chance. It has prepared fathers to be biologically primed to be able to parent. Secondly, evolution hates redundancy. Evolution is obsessed with, the, with the conserving energy. That is the currency of life. And it doesn't cause two roles to evolve to be identical unless that is necessary for survival. And in the case of human parents, it's not. And when we look at the roles of a mum and a dad in a heterosexual relationship, what we find is that their roles are complementary rather than mirroring each other. They are different and they are supposed to be. So first of all, when we look in the brains of a mum and a dad when they are interacting with their child, we see different areas of peak activation. So when we look at the mum's brain, the peak in activation in that brain when she's, for example, watching a video of her child playing is in the very core of the brain, where the nurture, where the risk detection is. But when we look at dad's peak activation in the brain, we see it in the neocortex. That's that little blue bob there in the prefrontal cortex. And there, that's because he seems to be more focused on pushing those developmental boundaries, making the child go out into the world and achieve. Now, be aware, this is the peak activation. I am not saying that men do not nurture and women do not push developmental boundaries. But there is a difference in the peak of where that occurs. However, what happens if you don't have a dad or you don't have a mum? Let's say you're a gay couple. So studies have been done on gay fathers, looking at gay primary caretaking fathers and what happens in their brains when they interact with their children. Now, one of these men, generally in gay couples, is taking on the mum role. And what we see when we look at his brain is we see peaks in activation in both areas of the brain, both the neocortex and in the limbic area. The human brain is astonishingly plastic. And in this case, it has changed to enable that man to be able to fulfill both those key roles so that his child gets that complete developmental environment. And what's even more exciting for those of us who study the brain is that there is a new neural connection between these two areas, allowing both sides of his parenting personality to communicate with each other. So that's a difference between fathers and mothers. Another big one comes with the different attachments they build with their children. So if we look at attachment, what we're talking about is a very specific, deep, intense and profound bond between two people. In a way, it's the psychological attempt to put a, an objective measure on love. So our attachment profiles affect how we experience love and how we behave when we're in love. But the attachment that a mum builds with her child is different to the one a dad builds with his child. So if we look at the one that the mum builds, it's very much based on nurture. The way I like to think about it is that it's a very exclusive bond. So the child is hugged to the mother, it's very inward looking, and it's all based on making that child feel safe and avoiding risks. When we look at dad, nurture is definitely up there, and it's very important that a father builds a nurturing and secure bond with his child. But on top of that nurture, there is an additional bit for dad, and that is challenge. And that challenge is related to, in fact, turning the child's face to the world beyond the family and saying, here is the world, and I'm going to give you the skills to survive in it. And he does that because he builds a secure base for his child based on that nurture, and that child is then able to go out into the world, always knowing that if it becomes too tricky, he can return to dad for, for a bit of nurture and a cuddle. But dads build their bonds with children in a different way to mum. It's fair to say that mum does get a head start because giving birth, as those of you who've done it, know it's a massive flood of hormones, okay? And that gives mum a head start so that she crucially bonds with her baby quickly and can deal with all its demands despite having absolutely no sleep. Dads don't get that head start, so they have to build their bond in a different way. And they do it via interaction with their baby. Now, in those first few weeks of life, that can be a little bit tricky because babies don't really do very much and they certainly don't give you anything back. And this is why for some men, they state that their bond with their child feels like it's not developing maybe as quickly as the one they see with the mother, that there's some sort of delay in bonding. And it's certainly something that I prepare those fathers that I follow for after birth that it might take some time to build that profound attachment to your child. But really, don't panic because it does come. So the first level of attachment you will have with your child, dads, is when baby appears and you have that quite conscious attachment where, which is based on genetic relatedness. 
But if I come to see you six months down the line, the bond you have with your child is so much more deep, so much more profound, and that's because you have been interacting with your child. Because as the child develops and they become more able in terms of their motor skills and their cognitive skills, you start to get something back. They start to babble, they start to giggle, they smile at you. And around six months, something wonderful happens between fathers and their children. And this is the start of rough and tumble play. Now, I think we all know what this is. This is when a dad comes home from work, launches the child into the air, spins it round, tickles it till it feels sick, um, throws it up in the air, and there's lots and lots of giggling and quite a lot of risky behavior. And quite often, there's a, a woman screaming in the background. Um, this is rough and tumble play, and it is vital to building the bond between child and father and also for the child's development. Because you see, rough and tumble play releases a, a cascade of hormones, beta endorphin, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and they are all key to creating that bond between father and child. And because it's so quick and a little bit painful, we, it means that we get this absolute ramped up impact of those hormones on, on dad and child. But secondly, it's crucial because it starts to help that child experience the possible risks that they're going to experience in the world. It's starting to challenge that child's cognitive and behavioral development. Because when you're actually playing with someone very, very quickly, for a start, you have to deal with mental and physical challenge, a little bit of risk, a little bit of pain. You have to empathize with the other person to understand what are they going to do next to me and have I gone too far? And you also have to understand reciprocity, that taking of turns. So it builds your mental and physical resilience, and it's dad's real first step into preparing his child to go out into the world. And the even more exciting thing about this, this um, rough and tumble play is it's evolved to, to mean that dads and children prefer to play with each other. Now, I'm a mum, and I know if one of my children falls over, they rush to me. But I also know that compared to my husband, I'm a deeply boring human being. And therefore, my children prefer to play with my husband. And there is a reason for this. Children and dads get a peak in oxytocin from playing with each other. We can see it in the brain on the scanner screen. They get a peak in oxytocin from being nurtured by their mums. So mums are really good at playing, we certainly are, but we don't get that neurochemical peak and neither does our kid. So it has evolved that fathers and children gravitate towards each other to play with each other. When I started researching fathers over a decade ago, the general consensus was dads had no involvement in child development. As we have a society where mums tend to still be the primary carers, they were the environment that was the developmental environment for that child, and dads didn't really get a look in. Now, we've got evolution preparing dads to do this amazing job. We've got it making sure that they complement the mother's role so the child gets that entire developmental environment. So it's very hard to believe that we've gone through this massive upheaval in life history to create this unique mammal this human father, without them having some input into the development of their child, which means that that child survives and thrives in our society. And that is certainly the case. And there are two key points in a child's life when fathers really are the major influence on that child's success. And that's in the preschool stage and during adolescence. And the reason for that is both of these stages are key stages when the child is stepping beyond the family and going out into the wider world. So when a child first goes to preschool or nursery, suddenly they're having to learn a whole new set of rules. Because when you're in the family, maybe we're a little more benign about your, your emotional outbursts and the fact that you nick things from other children. But when you go to preschool, you need to learn how to control your behavior and be nice and helpful and stick to the rules. And it seems to be that dad is underpinning that first step out into the wide world. And at adolescence, again, a child is stepping even further away from their family. This is the point when peers start to become more of an influence than parents. And again, dad is key in scaffolding that child's entry into real adult independence. But if, first of all, we look at the influence that both parents have on their child's brain development. So a recent study showed that there is a direct relationship between how sensitive you are as a parent and your child's actual brain density. So this was a study done looking at interactions between parents and their children between the ages of one and four. So at the age of one, it was very much a free uh, play session. As they became older, it was more about how a parent helped a child solve a puzzle problem, scaffolded their learning. 
And there was a direct relationship between how sensitively they dealt with their child, how sensitively their child's grey and white brain density, particularly in the cortical and neocortical areas, when they were eight years old. Also, if we look at parental brain density, if we look at primary caretaking parents, so that's mums and dads, and we look at the brain density they have in three key areas of the brain, so that's the limbic area, that's the core of your brain where all that nurturing and emotion is, in the mentalizing area of the brain, that's the bit of your brain where you, it's theory of mind, where you can second guess what somebody else is going to do, whether you can second guess whether they're going to lie or deceive you. It's a really important social skill. And also in the empathizing area of the brain. So that's the ability to understand someone's emotional state and be able to react appropriately to it. So there was a direct correlation between the density of grey and white matter in these three areas of the adult brain and the ease with which that child adapted to preschool. So that's things like emotional regulation, being able to self-soothe, social engagement, positive emotions. But it's also those pro-social skills. We call them sharing, caring, and helping. So related to the grey and white matter in their parents' brain dictated how well they could achieve that easy transition into preschool. But looking at fathers specifically at the preschool stage, there seem to be some key areas in which they have a particular influence above and beyond that of mum. First of all, it's in the development of language, and obviously language is the grease that really gets those cogs of social interaction going. And there seems to be a particular influence of fathers on language at the preschool age. So a study of a group of babies at the age of 12 months, and again, how they were in interacted with their parents, how sensitively their parents did that, influenced the development of language at the age of three years. Now, initially, this turned out to be the case for both mums and dads. However, if you controlled for the parents' social economic status, so that's how much money they earned, levels of education, that kind of thing, it was actually only dad who then turned out to be the one that influenced language at three years. So a father, regardless of his social economic background, regardless of where he comes from, is the key parent for influencing language development in preschool children. Secondly, they are the key parent for influencing executive function, which is a bit of a technical term, but it's three key skills. First of all, the development of your working memory. So the ability to store things with easy retrieval in your brain to enable you to answer questions and solve problems. Attention, very key at preschool and as you go through your educational life. So can you attend to one thing without being distracted by everything else? And inhibitory control. So that's the ability to inhibit those less than helpful behaviors in the uh, preschool setting. And again, looking at fathers, they seem to have a particular influence on this particular skill at the age of 24 months, above and beyond mum's influence. And that seems to be linked to the fact that fathers have a particular role in the stimulation of development. Because they have a role in the stimulation of development, they are the ones who are going to push the child to be able to have this powerful executive function and to be able to fulfill these three areas of skill. And then the next stage is teenagehood. And at teenagehood, fathers have a, a bigger influence on their child's mental health than the mums do. And there's a particular reason for this. And that is because fathers are the parent that scaffold the child's entry into the social world. And to be able to go in the social world, you do need to be mentally and physically resilient. You need to be able to deal with challenge. You need to be able to deal with failure and pick yourself back up and dust yourself off and carry on. And you need to be able to assess risk. And because dad is the parent who is the one who really teaches the child how to do all these things, he has an undue influence on their mental health because most mental health conditions express themselves in the social domain. So several studies have shown, for example, that fathers and the attachment that a father builds with his child has a particular impact upon rates of depression, loneliness, and the level of self-esteem. And a really interesting point is that children get more of their self-esteem as teenagers from the time they spend with their dad than the time they spend with their mum. So if they feel important to their father, they are more likely to be mentally resilient than they do to their mum. But what's really, really important when it comes to children's self-esteem and the self-esteem of teenagers is actually how important they feel to you and how much you spend time interacting. And for dads, it's the interaction that's particularly important because interestingly, children measure their importance to their mums and dads in different ways. So they think they're important to their mum if their mum spends time nurturing and caring for them. But if they want to 
assess the importance they are to their dad, it's about how much time does dad spend with me? How much time do we spend doing things together? And those seem to be the key things for fathers. So it's important, that interaction. But it doesn't have to be anything amazing. It can be really run-of-the-mill domestic chores. It can be washing the car, taking the dog for a walk, cooking a meal. Nothing really big, but it's about that one-to-one -one time that you spend with your adult child or your teenage child. And a really interesting study, which actually shows us that this doesn't necessarily have to be biological dad who has this influence, was done on biological fathers and stepfathers. And this was looking at keeping a log of how much interaction they had over the child's teenage years, and then looking at how well that adult child dealt with stress when they were in their 20s. And children who had spent a lot of time interacting with their dad or stepdad, and therefore had felt important and got good self-esteem from it, dealt with stress much better. They had lower cortisol reactions to stress problems in their adult life than those who did not. And really, just to get a little bit tub thumpy at this point, we critically need dads to step in and do this right now. We are at a bit of a mental health crisis, particularly amongst teenagers in this country, partly because of the complicated social world we now live in. And so I say to dads, if you can just do this, if you can spend a little bit of time interacting with your teenager, which I appreciate is not necessarily easy, as they tend to push you away, but if you can find those 5, 10, 15 minutes to spend that, that time walking the dog with them, it will reap benefits for them in the long term. We're just going to touch a little bit on anthropology, because let's face it, I'm an anthropologist. And moving on from the science and, and, and the mental health area, Another really key thing that comes out about being a dad as I look around the world at the dads I've studied is that they are amazingly flexible. The dad's role around the world is incredibly diverse. And one of the reasons for that is men are less tied in their parenting role than women. We are quite biologically restricted because we are pregnant, then we give birth, and then possibly we breastfeed. And that's quite restrictive, so that dictates our role to a certain extent. Because fathers aren't tied by that, they can be more flexible in their approach to parenting. But being an anthropologist, obviously, we dig around trying to find some pattern to the diversity that we see. And one anthropologist known as Robert Devine came up with a model to explain flexibility around the world based upon the level of the risk and the nature of the risk that the father perceives in that environment. So, for example, if it's a high-risk environment and there's actual physical risk to that child's survival, then you will see absolutely no on, on hands-on fathering going on at all. That father is completely focused on protecting that child's actual life. So, for example, there's a tribe in South America known as the Ache, uh, and they're a very warlike tribe. They spend a lot of time fighting each other and, and uh, raiding each other's villages. And there's a very high risk if your village is raided that, first of all, your father will be killed, and secondly, that you will also be killed during that raid. And therefore, fathers spend a lot of time on the actual protection of their villages and really no time on the hands-on care of their children to make sure that their children survive to adulthood. If we're in a medium-risk environment, then what we tend to see is economic survival is the key. Because physical survival is okay. But if you are living on the economic edge, if you have to work very hard, for example, you're in a pastoral trade and you have to spend a lot of time in the fields, it's actually teaching your children the skills of that economic survival job. So the farming skills, the production skills, the negotiation skills, to make sure that they will go on to be economically successful when they grow up. An example of that is the Kipsigis, who are a tribe that live in Kenya. They are tea growers, and they live in a very marginal environment. It's a very, very tough thing to bring that tea to, uh, to full maturity, and then actually go and negotiate it and sell it in the market. So again, Kipsigis men don't do any hands-on nurturing of their children, but when their teenage boys reach that age, they take them out into the fields, they show them the skills of farming so that they can do that, and they crucially also take them to the male-only meetings that occur in the village and beyond the village where social relationships are built, and upon those social relationships, we get those trading relationships so that you can sell your tea for a good amount of money. So they take their sons along to those meetings to make sure their sons have the negotiation skills to be able to go forward and be successful. And then we have low-risk environments, and that is what we generally have in the West. So there, our physical survival is generally okay. Our economic survival is comparatively, if you look at the globe, very strong. 
So in a low-risk environment, you will tend to find much more hands-on parenting going on, because there, a father's concern is the risk to their child of not being educated enough or socially connected enough to achieve success in our, wide, in our big, wide Western world. Because it's still the case in the Western world that it's actually who you know who's going to dictate your success. So fathers spend a lot of time helping their children with homework, taking them to museums. Some of you may have brought your children here today to help them understand science. It's about doing that, and then it's about making sure they have lots of social connections, and you use all your skills and all those, uh, all those connections you have, for example, to get them a really good internship at the end of school. And that's the critical thing for Western Western dads to ensure that when their children go out into our really, really complicated social world, that they will be able to survive and succeed. And my final thing I want to say to you is I've been talking about dads for the last, what, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, and I haven't once really defined dad for you. Being a dad is not about being genetically related to your child. Being a dad is actually stepping up and doing the job. So many of the people we look at around the world who their children refer to as dad and are given the name of dad aren't actually biologically related to their children. So let's look at the Aceh, shall we? So this is this warlike tribe. And because it's such an incredibly risky environment, they operate a system of paternity called partible or multiple paternity. So children have more than one dad. And this is the reason for this is if your village is raided and the father is killed, if the child does not have a father, it increases the likelihood they will die by about 25%. But if they have another father to step in and protect them, then they have a good likelihood of being able to survive. And because of this, children in the Ache have several fathers. They all have slightly different names, but they are all recognized as dads. And the way this works is that a dad is anybody who has been with the woman for a year before the baby is born. Any of those men are known as the father. And they all put up with this system because it really is the case that if they did not, there was a very high chance that your child, which might have your genes, would die. So you see, there are many different ways of being a father. There are stepfathers, there are social fathers. Social fathers could be an uncle, a grandfather, a teacher, a friend. There are many different ways of being a dad. So we're very, very careful when we research that we find out who is identified as dad within that environment. And if we look at that research on mental health and ability to deal with stress, you do not have to be the biological father to have these influences on your children. It's about stepping up and doing the job. So why do I want to share this with everyone? I spend a lot of time talking about fathers. I wrote my book because I wanted to spread the word about dads. And there's a reason for it in the first instance. I want men to be empowered to father by the knowledge that we have now acquired about who they are. I want them to be empowered by the evolutionary story that shows that fathers aren't some byproduct, some secondary parent, some bag carrier. They were selected for because they are critical to the survival of their children. I want them to be empowered by the biology. They are as primed to parent as a woman is. We see hormonal changes, we see brain changes, we see psychological changes, which I haven't had time to touch on here. There are many ways that a man is prepared to parent. They are crucially different to the mom in a heterosexual relationship. And that's important because they need to provide this entire developmental environment for their child. So dads are dads, they're not male mums. They do it in a very particular way and it's really critical that they do. They are unique. They bring a unique element to their child's development. And in some areas, they are heads above mum in terms of inputting into that development. They're incredibly diverse. There are many different ways to being a father. And when you look around the globe and you can see how many different ways your fellow fathers fulfill their role, it's quite astonishing. And they're incredibly flexible. Fathers are the ones who can react quickly to environmental change. And that is what we see when we look at them on the ground. They are the ones, minute by minute, to change their role to ensure the survival of their child. So I want men to be empowered. I want them to feel that they are equal parents to women. And I want those of us who deal with fathers to actually support them in that role and stop seeing them as useless or absent or secondary. But also, if we understand who dad is, it actually brings about societal change. Because in those areas, in those countries where we've seen more equality for fathers in terms of parenting, what we see is we see an increase in equality in the home, 
which leads to women being able to return to work earlier, which means that they don't have the same career penalty that some of us do when we have children, and it leads to a reduction in the gender pay gap. So actually it's important to all of us, not just men, not just their children, but society itself, that we start to recognise who human fathers really are and how important they are to their children. So thank you very much for listening. I'm going to be over there somewhere signing my book after this, so if you want to come and have a chat, do, and I'll answer any questions you have. Thank you very much.